All right, here's a little video where we're going to start to take a look at West Africa. We've already looked at Africa overall and with geography, but now let's get in and focus on West Africa. And we're going to start on the empires of Ghana, which expands into Mali and then Songhai. Overall, West Africa is incredibly physically diverse in that you've got the desert, the savanna, and the forest all in a very small remote region. Uh, and you've got the variety of ethnically, a variety of different tribes, as well as culturally, uh, the tribes with uh, different cultural practices, and a variety of when it comes to the sizes of these tribes, from small little homesteads to villages to massive cities. We see the move to agriculture uh, right around the year 1000 BC to 200 C, depending on the region. Uh, tribes in the savanna are going to adopt agriculture a lot faster than those in the forest. Uh, because in the savanna, all they have to do is really uh, clear out an area uh, of grass and then they can plant. In the case of the forest, they're going to have to chop down an entire forest to set up a farm. So it takes them a bit longer to develop into massive agricultural civilizations. As far as what they're producing, they're producing rice, millet, uh, and sorghum, while they're also tending herds of cattle and goats. And so we get a lot of rice farming in West Africa, and as a result, uh, later on in America, rice is going to be a, a huge crop and a lot of slaves are going to know how to make it already because they've got the experience from West Africa. Uh, the Nok people of the forest region were already producing iron and tool weapons by 500 BC, so we've got advancements in agriculture and iron working. The economy is going to grow with trade within West Africa as they're trading different agricultural products and iron, uh, but also they're going to start to trade across the Sahara Desert. Let's start with ancient Ghana. This is the first known kingdom in the Western Sudan, yes, in that Western region, uh, founded by the Soninkoi people, and Ghana literally translates to king. And we start to see that they are known throughout Europe and throughout the Middle East or Southeast Asia for their wealth through trade. They're making a lot of money, okay, billions of dollars, especially when the camel is introduced, the Asian camel is introduced around the first century, allowing for more trade across that massive Sahara Desert right, into North Africa. Uh, before they had to, it was really a long process to cross the desert. Camels really speed that up and allow for increased amounts of trade. North Africa has started to produce a whole lot of silk, cotton, glass beads, horses, mirrors, uh, dates, right, like the, the fruit dates, uh, as well as salt. And so they're producing things that right, the West Africans want. West Africans are producing things like uh, pepper, people that sell slaves, as well as a good amount of gold. Uh, salt, I would throw that in there too. Uh, slaves were usually war captives as these different tribes, different kingdoms were fighting each other. If you were a prisoner of war, you became a slave and would often be sold into slavery across Africa. Uh, gold was actually produced outside of the kingdom and the Wangara region to the southwest, and but was taxed heavily. Anybody that passed through the kingdom of Ghana had to pay a pretty heavy tax. And so we got massive amounts of gold really building up this empire. And we started to see some interesting architecture in this early uh, Ghana area. Before 400, uh, the Romans were dominating North Africa. There was uh, really anything touching the Mediterranean was part of the Roman Empire. So the Romans dominated North Africa, making Roman merchants and Berbers, which are native North Africans, their chief trading partners. They, really dependent on the Roman Empire for trade. And then the Roman Empire fell apart starting around 400. And so as the Romans declined and weakened, they stopped trading with the Romans and they had to find new trade partners. And this is the rise of Islam. And so as, as Islam spread, we started to get Arab merchants arriving and they started to bring their religion into the, into the capital. And Muslims started to really make their way into the hierarchy, into the government and really dominate royal bureaucracy. And they started to even bring in their own writing system really to become a really useful to the government and uh, really necessary for an efficient government with their writing. Uh, commercial and religious rivalries, however, started to destroy the kingdom by the 1100s. Uh, the Almoravids were the kind of North African Islamic Berbers. They were the main competitors for control of the trans-Saharan trade, trade across that massive desert. And so in 992, Ghana's ar army captures the Almoravid trade center near their capital. 
Okay. And then 1076, the Almoravids return to take Ghana. And then okay, the Soso people destroy Kumbisale, destroy the capital at Kumbisale around 1200. And so it's this, uh, this change in trade and this competition for gold that starts to really cause the fall. And so here are the trade networks that they're fighting over in these major cities, Timbuktu and Gao. And, but they're, they're fighting over control over these networks, these trade routes across the desert. After Ghana, we get the Kingdom of Mali. Uh, the Mandinga people are led by Mansa, or King Sundiata, who defeated the Soso. The Soso were kind of these placeholders at the Battle of Karina, 1235. And they established the Empire of Mali as a Muslim state. And so we had Muslim influence in Ghana, okay, but in the case of Mali, this is a Muslim empire. And the Muslim status was chosen for a reason. Part of it was a real religious desire, uh, but it was also opportunity. And that if they were Muslim, they had increased trade and status with okay, their neighbors in Arab states. And Mali literally translates uh, where the emperor resides, the home of the emperor. Socially, politically, economically, similar to Ghana, it's kind of built on the ashes of what was the Ghana Empire, but they just kind of build up. They expand their territory. It's 1,500 miles okay, from the Atlantic Ocean all the way along the Niger River. Uh, the southern ter starts, territory starts to produce even more crops. They, instead of just taxing the gold mines of Wangara, they control the gold mines of Wangara. And with this extra gold, this extra territory, this extra food, their empire really starts to grow, and the population grows to 8 million. Timbuktu becomes really the center of the trans-Saharan trade, and so it's a center for trade on the edge of the Sahara, and so it's right on the edge. It's kind of the first area where you're out of the desert, and you're next to a nice river, an area where you can get some nice food for the first time in a long while. Uh, it becomes a center for trade in gold from that Wangara region. Uh, and so a lot of gold coming out from here, uh, as well as slaves and salt by the 1200s. It also becomes a center for Islamic learning, with several mosques being built in the area, 150 uh, Islamic schools and a law school, all in Timbuktu on the edge of their empire. But they're also known for religious and ethnic tolerance. This is an area for trade. Uh, they'll certainly promote Islam, but they're gonna, they'll, they'll deal with anybody that's got the money. Uh, Mansa Musa, the world's richest man to date, worth $400 billion. Uh, compare that to Bill Gates' $79.6 billion this year. Mansa Musa did all right. The uh, main reason we really know all about him is because he really shows off that wealth in his pilgrimage to Mecca, where he has an entourage of 60,000 people, a train of 100 elephants, and he just gives away gold bricks, a right? to anybody along the way, and really just giving away money to the poor on his journey. He comes back with an Arabic library, and he brings back religious scholars, as well as a Muslim architect to build some of the great mosques in Gao and Timbuktu that still stand to this day, and they're architectural triumphs, because they're made out of mud, uh, kind of adobe like out here, but still standing, uh, built around the 1300s. Uh, but after his death, the empire starts to fall apart and decline, uh, Sunni Ali shows up, captures Timbuktu in 1468 to kind of start a new empire. And so it's, it's the kind of peak of the Mali Empire. Uh, after Mali, we get the Songhai Empire. And we kind of see in this map where we've got Ghana, and then we build up to Mali, and then expand even further to the Songhai Empire. Uh, they were known for great as great traders, so they're going to have the money, but also as great warriors, so they're able to fight. And they first break off from Mali, and then they completely overtake Mali. Uh, Sunni Ali is one of the great leaders, expands the empire, and requires conquered people to pay tribute, but largely lets them rule over themselves. So he's got his army, and as long as you kind of pay him money, hey, you're going to be part of his empire, and he won't mess with you. Uh, Aski Muhammad Tore revolts against Ali's son. He takes over the crown from 1492 to 1528. Uh, he allies with Morocco and Egypt to kind of have these, again, uh, stronger trade partners in Morocco and Egypt on the other side of Africa. And this allows them to increase education. Again, Timbuktu becomes the center for the study of law, medicine, math, and theology for Africa. 
He expands his empire, and you can see that in the orange bars out there. Uh, he also centralizes his rule. Here's kind of an artist rendition of Oski Muhammad. Uh, he centralizes his rule by replacing local chiefs with members of his own family. And so he'll conquer a village, he'll put a cousin in charge of that village, and instead of taxing, he's going to ask for the occasional pile of cash. And he also is going to establish trade regulations, so he's going to take a cut of that for his empire. Um, the peak and decline of the empires under Oski Daud between 1549 and 1582. Since the 1430s, Portugal shows up, and Portugal makes a mess of things, as we'll see in South Africa. Uh, Portugal wanted to establish trade centers along the Guinea coast, along West Africa. They wanted gold, and as they started to take a lot of the gold from the usual trade routes, because this gold was usually going to North Africa and to uh, the Arabian Peninsula, but instead, because the gold is being drawn off, this is going to anger their competitors, the people that they used to sell gold to, they're going to want to fight for that gold now that Portugal's taking it. And so uh, it's messing up the usual pattern when Portugal shows up. 1591, the king of Morocco attacks the capital of Gao to regain access to the gold that they used to have. And they attack with European weapons that Songhai did not have, uh, with Moroccan guns, uh, muskets, and cannons. They take out the Songhai army that only had bows and lances. After this, the Songhai government collapses because they just can't take on this army, and they've lost their capital city. In West Africa, really, they lacked a central government powerful enough to intervene when the Portuguese and then the other Europeans, uh, as well as some of the African kingdoms, started to say, all right, how about instead of gold, let's start to sell each other? And this becomes the rise of the Atlantic slave trade in there's not a government strong enough to stand up and stop this slow descent into slavery. And so here this is another picture hey, of hey, King of the Songhai Empire. It's a little reference to the video game Civilization. Woot. All right, we'll stop there. And uh, in the next video is going to focus on the forest region.